it is four o'clock central time, so I think we will go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to everybody online. Hope it's a beautiful day wherever you are. It's a beautiful day here in Kansas uh, to go out and look at wheat fields. Um, we are um, on day two of our online wheat tour here. My name is Aaron Harries. I'm Vice President of Research and Operations for Kansas Wheat. Uh, coming you, to you from the Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan. If you're joining us just for the first time today, welcome. Uh, what we're doing this year, since the Wheat Quality Council canceled their tour, is just doing an online version where we can provide you with up-to-date information um, from reports out in the field. Uh, we're breaking this down by crop district in Kansas uh, for the next few days, and we'll have a couple of presentations today and then we'll have report of the numbers that we saw today. Um, just a couple of housekeeping reminders. Um, if you're gonna join us the next couple of days, the login, the Zoom link is the same, um, and there is a password for it. Every time you log in, that password is 402-517, and there is no need to re-register for each of those days. Uh, once you sign up for it, um, you are registered for all three days, so there won't be um, any need to re-register. So, okay, with that, we'll get started. Um, welcome again to our, our virtual wheat tour. Um, the hashtag for Twitter is wheat tour 20. Uh, if you want to follow at Kansas wheat, it's at Kansas wheat. And then if you want to follow Romlo Lolato, the extension wheat specialist with K state, he's at KSU wheat and you really should be following him. He posted a lot of uh, great data online today, photos and reports from the field, and we will hear from him later. I want to thank our volunteers, certified crop advisors, uh, K-State research and uh, extension personnel really submitted a lot of good numbers today, and then the uh, farmers who have been out there uh, submitting their numbers also. So here's today's program. Again, we'll try to keep this to around 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, we're going to have a report on the wheat crop from our friends at Nebraska Wheat, and Colorado wheat. We'll actually start with Colorado, then go to Nebraska. Uh, Jeannie uh, Falk joins, will join us again from Northwest Kansas to report on the wheat conditions in Northwest Kansas. Uh, then we'll take a look at what we saw out in the field today. Uh, cross your fingers if the technology allows, uh, Romulo is gonna join us from out in the wheat field so uh, we can take a close look at things. And then I'll provide you with the numbers and results from today and take your questions. So just a reminder, day one today, our data came from North Central Kansas and Northwest Kansas in those cropping districts. We're gonna break down the numbers by district, North Central and Northwest. Um, this is the latest crop progress report uh, that we issued today from Kansas Wheat. You'll note that the good to excellent rating did go up one point each in that category. So there was a little bit improvement. Uh, at the same time, our drought has expanded and worsened in Southwest Kansas. And, and tomorrow when we report on West Central and Southwest Kansas, we're almost certainly gonna see some much worse reports of wheat in that part of the state. So it'll be interesting to contrast that. Uh, disease continues to erupt pretty quickly across the state. It's really gonna be a race. Uh, if the forecasts hold true and we uh, continue with moderate temperatures, and some rainfall, we really expect that stripe rust to explode. So that's gonna be uh, a challenge for a lot of the farmers out there, uh, whether they're gonna go ahead and treat that with fungicides. With that, I think we'll uh, stop right there with um, that information and we wanna turn it over to uh, our colleague, uh, Brad Urker. Uh, Brad is the executive director of the Colorado uh, Wheat Administrative Committee, and he's going to share with us a little bit of report on what's going on in Colorado. If you have questions for Brad, please submit those right now via chat because uh, Brad unfortunately has another uh, obligation he has to get to. So if you want to submit questions for him right now, we'll try to ask those uh, before he leaves. But okay, I'll turn it over to Brad. All right, thank you, Aaron. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Uh, with a PowerPoint presentation to help uh, guide this conversation. And I've got a map of Colorado up there. Hopefully you're seeing that. Um, well, hello everybody. As Aaron said, I'm Brad Urker, Executive Director of Colorado Wheat. Uh, myself and our seed and trade specialist, Tyler Benninghoven, made a trip around um, 
Eastern Colorado last week uh, to take some tow accounts and provide some information for this. I'm kind of going to break my talk uh, today into three different districts. I'm going to start uh, in the southeast and move to the northeast because I, I want to be able to finish on a positive note and uh, the southeast would probably be a positive note. So the, the NAS districts that they have um, have uh, the orange counties down there in the southeast. I'll cover that first then move into the green counties, kind of the east central district, and finish with the counties I have in blue here up in the northeast. Um, the story for us, uh, the major story for us, of course, is the drought. And as you can see, we've got some D2 and D3 drought down here in the southeast uh, part of uh, Colorado. It's been affecting the crop all last fall, winter, and the spring. Um, that'll be a big part of the story for my next uh, few minutes here. Here's our Colorado crop condition over the course of the spring. And as you can see, if I put in this black bar here, our crop condition has sort of steadily declined since about late March, as we just haven't gotten enough precipitation to promote good crop development. Um, that's across the state. There is some good wheat uh, kind of everywhere. We traveled last week, but uh, it, it improves as you go north. And, and most of the better wheat is up in the north. Um, our current crop condition, uh, I just put on the screen here. So we kind of have a quarter of our crop roughly in each of the, the lower four categories there. Very poor, poor, very good, but just very little in the excellent category. And we lost about seven points on our good to excellent wheat here this last week from 33% down or five to seven points down, down to only 28% now up in that good to excellent. So if we start in the southeast, um, we've got about 15% of our acres in this district pictured here, so that'd be about 275,000 acres. Our largest counties are down there, Prowers and Baca counties. Um, hearing a lot of uh, reports uh, from some growers I've talked to about abandonment happening now down in southeast Colorado, unfortunately. So I've got uh, an estimate of currently about 25% abandonment down there. Um, hard to know if that number is really accurate, but that's just from talking to some of the growers down there. Uh, could go to 50% if we continue to be dry, which is what the forecast says will be happening for the next week to 10 days. So that would take our harvested acreage down to about only 205,000 acres down in this district. I'm estimating really only about a 15 bushel per acre yield on the fields that are kept. So not a whole lot of wheat expected out of Southeast Colorado this year at this time for me, uh, only about 3.2 million bushels. As I move up into East Central, uh, quite a few more counties in this district with uh, some larger counties, larger wheat acres in this district. I've got some of the acres listed there. So about two thirds of our acres in East Central or about 1.25 million acres in this district. Um, this is where uh, we were able to get to last week and take some tiller counts. Um, I'm just starting to get notices of abandonment here. So I've, I've got uh, some estimates in a spreadsheet I've built that would range from 2% up to 25% abandonment in some of these counties. It would average out to about 7% so far. And like I said, no idea really how accurate that is because it's just anecdotal reports from some growers I've been talking to the last few days. Uh, but I do think abandonment starting to be a factor in the overall picture. Uh, we made 12 stops here last week to take tiller counts. Our average estimate was uh, 42.3 bushels per acre with it kind of ranging on the high side up in Yuma County from 57 bushels yield estimate potential down to Kit Carson County uh, having our lowest estimate only about 20. My weighted estimate for the district would be, is coming in right now at about 34 bushels per acre. So that would turn into just under a 40 million bushel uh, estimate coming out of this district for the crop. And then if I, I'll show you a picture here of what the, the plots, the test plots look like. And this is a test plot out of Brandon. So the southern end of what you see on the screen here, it's kind of what the wheat looked like. All of the wheat was pretty short, not really any wheat above knee high. A lot of it heading out at uh, mid, mid calf to below knee high. A little bit better plot up here at Yuma, Colorado. So a little farther north in the district where they've got more rain, a better tillering up there and better condition of the crop, a little more potential up there further north. As I go into the northeastern district here, we've got about 16% of our acres in this district. That'd be about 295,000 acres. Um, so also just starting to get some notices of, of abandonment, in some pockets, more, more pockets, I don't think quite as widespread up here in the northeast, but 
Uh, my father's farm, for example, last week he sprayed out 400 acres. So I know some of that is starting to go on. I've got that abandonment ranging from two to 10%, currently about 4% across the district. Uh, we were able to make six stops here last week. Our average was 52.9 uh, bushel to the acre with Sedgwick County kind of up there in the far northeast uh, corner of the state, up towards Royce in Nebraska, where they're not showing to be any drought up there. We had yield potential of 77. But across this district, my estimate's only 37 bushels to the acre. So a little bit better than East Central, but not much. Uh, 37 is what NAS has us statewide for as a, an average, I think, on the latest estimate coming from them. But I think if we factor in some of the southern counties, uh, that's probably, that probably needs to go down. So this, this district, I'm estimating about a little over 10 million bushels to come out of this district. And I would make note that, it, that the wheat stem sawflies were starting to emerge at our plot in Orchard, which is where I've got this red star on the map, kind of in Northwest Morgan County. Um, so the, the wheat stem sawfly has been a big factor in uh, reducing acreage of wheat in Colorado as growers try to plant other crops and uh, causing yield losses in the crop due to the you know, flattened fields that the wheat stem sawfly causes. Uh, this is a picture of the plot at Orchard. Uh, so the plot was looking really good, but the sawflies were coming out and this plot will probably be, be a referendum on uh, stem solidness as we go forward through the, through the season. The, the, the field just across the way behind the pickup there to the north last year was completely flat on the ground and the sawfly sorting of varieties was, was pretty evident there. Um, so trying to sum this up, uh, I think I've had about eight minutes out of my 10 maybe, so I'm trying to be pretty fast here. I apologize for that. But our, my, our estimate, I get my estimate for our, our crop in these three districts is just about 53 million bushels. Uh, we do have in, in NASA's overall number, uh, some Southwest counties and Northwest counties that add to the mix a little bit. I, th I don't think we'd see more than a, about 800,000 out of those districts. So that would put my statewide estimate for the day at about 54.2 million, which is you know about 7 million under where NAS pegged us last week. So I think with that, I'll, I'll try to stop and allow a little time for questions. Thanks a lot, Brad. So in general, do you think the uh, progress of the crop is on schedule, behind schedule, ahead of schedule? I think we're just a little bit behind. Um, we had about, I think, uh, 70, 7% jointed versus our average is like 88. So I think we are a little bit behind uh, according to, to NAS, but I think that's going to catch up pretty quick as it continues to stay dry. Okay. It uh, doesn't look like we have any questions coming in. Uh, Brad, if you're, if you're willing to share these slides with us, uh, we'll post them on the website for this. Um, and if uh, folks have any questions, you can sure uh, follow up with Brad, uh, get a hold of him at Colorado Wheat. So. Absolutely, be happy to. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Brad. Okay, we'll switch uh, over now to our, our neighbors to the north, um, Royce Shaneman. Uh, Royce is Executive Director of the Nebraska Wheat Board out of Lincoln. You're muted yet, Royce. Okay, can you hear me now? All right, I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen and let me know if that works. Here we go. Okay. Um, all right, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to share this information with you. Um, what I'll do is give a, a quick rundown on, uh, actually, on our whole state, the wheat industry, um, hit on the planning conditions, and then kind of let you know where we're at today. Um, for those of you that don't know, there's about 3,500 wheat farms in the state, and uh, we grow three, uh, three different market classes. Uh, the largest by far, uh, hard red winter wheat is the majority of our acres. Uh, then we have some hard white and 
All of that, to my knowledge, is under contract, about 30,000 acres. And then what we've seen in the last two to three years is a resurgence of uh, hard red spring wheat, especially in the southwest corner of the state. Uh, we have somewhere around 15,000 acres planted. Um, last year, we harvested 55 million bushels. And as most of you know, we export about half the crop we grow. Uh, the state has four flour mills, uh, uh, two of those in Omaha, uh, one in Lincoln. The one in Lincoln is an organic mill. And then uh, we have one small mill out uh, in the western part of the state. And then uh, we also have about 60 organic wheat farms that produce about uh, 425,000 bushels of organic wheat. And then we also are the home to six commercial bakeries. Okay, if we take a look back uh, last year, and, and as I go through these slides, uh, you know, they're not gonna be as fancy as Colorado's, but um, I'm gonna start in the uh, nor Northern Panhandle, so Northwest, and I'll, I'll work my comments to the South and East. east. So in the Northern Panhandle last year, planting time uh, was, was on time. They had good moisture and uh, the crop got up and off to a nice start. Uh, as we got into the Southern Panhandle, uh, they were either on time or just a little behind normal. And that later planted wheat really struggled, uh, uh, you know, going forward from there. In the Southwest, um, the conditions were adequate with moisture. As you got farther south, planting was late due to some wetter conditions, uh, but they did have good emergence and, and decent growth going into the winter. In the South Central, um, most of that wheat was planted on time. Rain did slow a little bit of that. Um, and then of course that later planted wheat had uh, uh, slower emergence and, and maybe not as much growth going into dormancy. In the southeast, um, it was planted late, um, a lot of that mid-October, maybe even a little bit later, um, not much growth at all if it did emerge um, and, and uh, not very good condition going into winter. Uh, currently, the USDA has our um, most of our topsoil moisture across the state is in pretty good shape. The only area where we're seeing um, some dryness would be that southeast corner of the state. Typically that's our wet spot, um, but it has been dry and, and short of moisture. Uh, the majority of the state caught anywhere from um, half an inch to an inch and a half of rain this past week. Uh, across the state, uh, the majority of the wheat is in the boot stage. Uh, South Central is jointing. And then uh, if we get down into that uh, Southeast corner, we are starting to see some heading, um, but it's very early and, and not a lot of it. Um, we're expecting some more rain uh, this coming week. And of course, as you know, this is a, a, a big state, widespread area. Uh, that moisture can vary dramatically from region to region. Uh, overall, uh, we've just had very minimal uh, disease or pests uh, that were, were being scouted for. So we've seen a few aphids in South Central Nebraska uh, some army cutworm in uh, the southern panhandle and southwest corner, but uh, nothing, uh, no heavy in infestations or anything, just pretty mild, pretty spotty. And then uh, about the only disease we've seen, uh, th there's been some leaf spot show up in a few fields in south central Nebraska, but again, uh, very mild, uh, not much to, to be concerned with at this point, but you know uh, the scouting will continue and and uh, 
hopefully we can avoid all those kind of pests and diseases going forward. Uh, we did have a number of producers from across the state go out and take um, a lot of different measurements. And we had wide ranges uh, in some areas of, of what the, the production might look like. And uh, in some of these cases, um, we may be comparing irrigated fields to dry land fields or, um, and then especially if, if they got into any of those white wheat fields, those are managed a little more intensely uh, because there are some uh, premiums uh, offered for certain, um, uh, certain quality characteristics and factors. So there, you know, there's always variation uh, but basically in the northern panhandle, uh, the majority of the, the estimates were between 45 and 55 bushel per acre. Southern panhandle, we saw anything from 30 to 70 bushels an acre. Uh, southwest, 40 to 60. South central, 50 to 60. And then southeast, uh, even though that's, that's the spot where the crop looks the toughest, they're, they're estimating 55 to 65 bushel per acre. So uh, with all the reports we got in, we did an average. Uh, uh, we came up with 50.8 bushels per acre as an average. And that would put us at a 42 million, just over 42 million bushel crop. Um, we only had 920,000 acres planted, uh, typically, about 92 to 90, or 90 to 92 percent of what's planted gets harvested. Uh, so that's how we come up with the, the 42 million on the estimates that were called in. Um, we have been doing some other um, uh, other scouting uh, over time, and our I would say with um, you know commentary from the producers that are are saying, you know, some of those tillers that they were counting maybe didn't look quite so viable. Uh, you know, uh, the crop is a little bit behind um, and the crop is very short this year. And I think it, it was set back with some of those uh, two or three uh, freeze events that we had here late. Um, so they're, you know, when you really get down and talk to the producers, um, if I had to make an estimate, I would say we're maybe just over a 41 million bushel crop. USDA's number was 41.7. Then our counts today were just over 42. So, uh, you know, if you want to split the difference, you can say maybe a 41.5 uh, would be a good average for, for what we think we're going to produce in Nebraska this year. And I think that's all I've got unless anybody has any questions. Okay, thanks Royce. Uh, and you did have some pretty severe cold, as you mentioned late. Did you have any any snowfall on wheat? I suppose that wasn't a concern since the crop was really small at that point in time. Um, we did have a little bit of snow up in that northern panhandle late, um, actually a couple different times, but uh, uh, the crop in that part of the state probably looks as good as anywhere. Um, the places where it really got hurt uh, was was uh, <laughs> right around those Easter freezes where it was pretty open and we had some pretty cold temperatures sustained for a number of hours over, um, you know, two or three nights in some areas and, mm -hmm. and that kind of hurt. Okay. Well, Royce, thanks, thanks for your time today. And if you, if you want to stick around a little while, if you can, we'll, we'll see if any questions come up, but um, share your slides with us and, and we appreciate the update. Thanks. Okay, well, we're gonna move along to uh, Jeannie Falk-Jones. Uh, she's a multi-county agronomist uh, for the Sunflower District, which is in, in Northwest Kansas. And it's uh, always interesting to hear the crop, about the crop out there. I know there's quite a bit of uh, variability again this year. And uh, Jeannie's gonna kind of give us a background of how that crop started and how it got to the point it is today and maybe give us an update on, on some of the things she saw when out scouting the crop uh, the last few days.
Okay, we can see your slides, Jenny. Well, we could. Except you couldn't hear me, and I couldn't get it to where I could turn it on and see slides at the same time here. Okay, how does that look? I think we're, hold on a second. I think we're good. Okay. So we'll just dive right in. Apparently it's not gonna click. There we go, to presentation. So um, just, I think Aaron hit the nail right on the head is that variability is really kind of what we're really seeing. And so, um, of that, I think that, uh, or maybe I should back up just a little bit in the fact that, hmm, there, can you see the slides now? We can see them. You're still in presenter view. I had that same problem earlier. It just has okay. to do with the monitor you use, but I, I think we can, uh, now we can see it. Okay. In normal Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, it looks good. Okay, so I think Erin's exactly right. Variability is really the name of the game of wheat in Northwest Kansas. Um, and I think that really stemmed clear back from when we're talking about drilling conditions. And so um, drilling conditions were just really um, influenced heavily by the management that had been done up to drilling time. And so I think that really played into the role of tillage and weed pressure and how long some of these weeds uh, were allowed to go before got the control. And, um, it was, you know, I talked to a the other day, and he, you know, maybe I have tilled that second time right before drilling, but I had a few weeds that I thought I needed to get under control, and I think I lost the moisture. And as a result, he had um, kind of marginal stands in his field. And so I think that really played into what we're seeing now is what was happening at drilling time. Um, that really, it resulted in some excellent wheat stands. We have some beautiful wheat in Northwest Kansas, and we have some really poor wheat in Northwest Kansas. I think I've looked at all of that today as I was running around looking at fields. So um, in general, I would tell you that we didn't have a great deal of, of fall growth on Lot of this wheat and, and pretty poor root development in general. And so a lot of that play into, uh, precipitation played into, into the effect of that. And so here's um, some information from uh, the Goodland National Weather Service Station. You can hear we're um, over an inch behind September. We're really making a difference on how well stands got established and got going. Um, here's a picture of, um, virtually from one of my plots and uh, you can see the top that was did on December 9th, or excuse, September 19th and actually be, um, things beyond control which involved a broken tractor and that uh, the rest of it wasn't did until a week later and so you can see the difference stand just based on a week's and a uh, difference planting date picture was taken uh, the first part of November I would tell you not did not grow very much. Um, all winter long, I had some farmers who were concerned about it was drilled, about it blooming during the winter, and that's not a very good feeling when you don't have enough fall growth to hold to hold oil in place. And so, this is kind of the what we were seeing across the areas were differences. Maybe right next to each other, just had a different planting date and different management really influenced what kind of got in the fall. Okay, so coming out of her, we are still seeing that. So we had the very sweet there on the left that had good stand really going well into um, the stuff there on the right where it looked pretty tough. Not very many showing up there. And so that carried over into the spring. Uh, we had some fields, like see this field here, we could row pretty well and um, had some pretty decent growth on it. And so in many cases, um, we were seeing some of this, this type of a look and feel, but surely not all of them. Okay, so that was back in March. So April was kind of rough on wheat in Northwest Kansas. And um, we had a couple of different events. We had that on May 3rd um, for Sherman County, which would be the Goodland area. Um, we dropped down to 16.6 degrees. And then if we move on forward um, about 10 days later, then we were dropping back down to 13.7. And so um, that drop there on April 3rd was a drop like a half 
kind of rebounded back up temperature wise. And then the second event was quite a bit longer, three days, um, it started cooling down on Easter and stayed cool for about three days. So um, really cooled things off. And so when we have these types of events, the first thing that I want to know as an agronomist and as a farmer is what growth stage are we at? So here is, um, a picture from April 6th. And so the growing point on this is still down below the soil surface. And so very well protected um, by the soil and the crown was well protected in there. So that was from the first freeze event. And so growing point was very well protected in that. And what we really saw resulting from that was just um, really a lot of cosmetic leaf burn. And we burnt the tips of leaves off. Um, and we were seeing this in a lot of fields um, just throughout the area, like from those temperatures, that wheat really did miss a beat, kind of kept on, on through growth stages from there. But then if we look at the second cold event, um, which was started there on Easter, and um, I have Sherman County up here, but temperatures across Northwest Kansas um, really just got cold and stayed cold, soil temperatures dropped. I mean, it was a significant time that everybody was paying attention here to what was going on. So um, here we go forward, where's the point on? Okay, well, you can see here that developing wheat head is now above the soil surface. And I tell you in general, when this event hit, um, the developing heads in the point were where from right below the soil surface to right at to maybe just slightly above. And um, so, all of that, some plants were still pretty well protected, but all of it was right there at that soil surface. Um, other thing is that we have um, some growth on some of this wheat by that point to kind of help pull some heat down the soil to that environment right down there close to that, to that soil area. So where our developing wheat heads are is always an important conversation. So um, here is some pictures taken from, I want to say, four days after the event um, being so cold, three days. So this is um, some pictures taken from Rollins County. Um, you can see uh, the necrotic view shown up here. We're not just seeing uh, necrotic or, or brown leaves, we're also seeing tillers showing up. And so we were losing tillers as part of this event, especially in this field here. And so um, that's what it was looking like. And so first you do is you start seeing stems, what it looks like, here's healthy wheat showing up. Um, we had other did not look good. And um, well, I, th just a few days after we have outright dead, um, uh, growth points and heads, but didn't look very good at that point. I remember when I was talking to the grower about this field, uh, he goes, so what do I do? And I said, well, I want just a little bit longer to really, so we can really grasp what's going on with this. And so, um, the interesting thing, some of these fields, there was an effect from the direction of the wind. Um, this field, and another one um, in really close proximity to this, I um, see some difference from the north side of the plant to the south side of the plant. And um, the north side, which is the, where the wind was coming from, and I kind of joke, there wasn't much between uh, that field and the north. It didn't seem like there wasn't much production out there for it. And so the north side of the plant seemed to be having more product area showing up there. Okay, so also from that same event, we had fields with way less injury. Mm -hmm. And so bottom left picture is just showing, um, that was um, days after the previous pictures were, and um, different field, very little damage um, from the cold temperatures, and may have the leaf tips that were um, burnt back, but we were seeing new growth really coming out of the stems. And that's what I told a lot of farmers is watch for that new growth. Um, splitting stems can be still a little challenging at that, at that point. So that new growth that's going on there. Um, we have other fields with more damage. So here is some pretty small wheat um, that uh, didn't handle the cold temperature near as good. And you can see um, the difference between the um, undamaged and damaged heads are from those cold temperatures. In many cases, we had some re-going up later on those 
plants, uh, but we did lose some tilts and thin some stands down as a result of that. We had a little bit of water that came with some cold weather, very last that cold. Um, most of the area, an inch to inches of snow. It was nice to have some moisture because we were getting a lot of that, but um, it, was some, it was just ice cake for what was going on, but really, I think we were just happy to have them. It didn't last long, but it did in snow. Okay, so what difference just a few uh, days can, so basically that top photo there, you see the rods and thing out there in, in that wheat. Now that wheat looked nice and green prior to the cold map, and that was um, here in central Tom County, uh, around that Colby area, the graph with the temperature on it show that they're on the Colby station we got 7.7 um the wheat was all um top left photo all kind of laying um to the south from the north winds and um you could just see rocks walking around out there and they were obviously eating bugs they caught my attention as I was driving by because I didn't expect to see them just really showing out there in the field and so um 23 days after that or 20 after that photo you can that um, that we had to put on growth and so it'll be a closer picture here. You see all of that necrotic leaf tissue and those tissues that had not make it coming there on the ground. We do have regrowth up from that. I had one farmer told me, he goes, well, it's good that it's growing, but he goes, we didn't have the moisture to spare to have to regrow a bunch of leaf tissue. And that's exactly right. And as a result, um, we did have growth. Uh, we weren't on a lot of extra tiller at that point it's because we didn't have a lot of more to, to start that. Now we have some small tillers going up, but there will be productive tillers uh, we'll add to our builds. Um, some didn't recover from the cold snap. And so this, you can see here, um, this is a patch in a field. And oh, because I have watched this field in this weed patch. Um, and while it was wheat established, you can kind of get going down the road, it wasn't very big, didn't have a lot of growth to it. And then after that cold stop, some of it just did not come back. I think that was a combination of cold and the drought stress. Maybe more drought stress in the cold too. Definitely played together in having these berries. And this is not horribly calm, but you can see some of this out in the area. So I mentioned drought stress. I don't have a picture of bluish cast to wheat. Um, if you were on here yesterday, Romolo showed one of those pictures. Um, it's a little hard to take pictures of really wheat that looks like it's suffering sometimes, it feels like. so. Um, but we were seeing drought stress showing up in some of this wheat um, here in the last two weeks. In those warm afternoons, it was really rolling up and had, had the blue look to it. Um, part of that is we still just don't have great root systems under some of this wheat. Um, some of it, there is moisture deep. So if you go to that six to eight inches or deep, deeper, there is some moisture down below there, but we just don't have a lot of root mass getting down to some of that. And we've been using a lot of moisture that it can get a handle, uh, get a hold of for some regrowth. Um, I would tell you that we did catch some rain this last uh, Friday night, kind of across the Northwest area, um, anywhere from probably 30, 30 points up to an inch 80 in places. So we did catch some moisture. And so that's helping us kick some of this wheat back into gear and growing, but we were really showing some drought stress prior to that. And, and Romolo had also shared the drought stress that's scary. Um, I haven't mentioned pests a whole lot, mostly because we haven't seen a lot of pests. Um, we did have some winter annuals. Um, there's clusters were in some, a few fields. We had uh, a little bit of kosher that was showing up. Uh, I would think, I really think our biggest concern with weeds is thinking about wheat that has been thinned out and that now we have a little bit of moisture, we have a flush of weeds coming up. And so that may really cause some problems getting into harvest because a lot of farmers were struggling making a herbicide decision on some of this. One, for the economics and two, um, because we were having some wheat 
looked fairly thick and then really got thinned out from, from those cold temperatures. Uh, disease pressure has been uh, really low. We've had um, some isolated instances of wheat streak mosaic. Um, I've been seeing a little bit of tan spot really showing up in the last week. Um, stripe rust continues to be on every farmer's mind um, and we keep listening, but we have not found stripe rust here in the northwest corner of the state and even in the northwest crop uh, reporting district. Um, Talking about insects, we've had a little bit of discussion on weed mites because of the drought conditions. Um, we've been finding, I've been finding aphids out in the fields, but right along are the ladybugs that are eating those aphids. So um, not a lot of pressure to think about. Um, in general, we have a wide variety of wheat conditions, and that was really reflected on the numbers that I turned in today. Um, this, These are both pictures from fields that I've looked at in the last 24 hours, and we have very thin stands. Left picture, and it's short, and it's thin, and it is drought stressed. Uh, well, I should, it has been drought stressed to hear the last little bit. Then we have pretty lush weed um, and a lot of that just goes back to management, management of moisture and just getting wheat off to a good start in many cases. So um, so yeah, just very big is the name of the for Northwest. There's fact information, I have any other questions, but I'm trying to answer some. Okay, thanks Jeannie. Um, that was a, a really good um, review of what you saw. Um, what about wheat stem sawfly? Any wheat stem sawfly? So wheat stem sawfly is um, something that we have talked about for a several years now, actually, for Northwest Kansas. Um, from what I understand, and I have not ever actually sampled for adults, but talking to the folks at CSU who come across and do a little bit of sampling for adults, they have caught some in Northwest Kansas. Um, and that, but, and I tell farmers every year, if you see wheat that looks like it has been cut off, give me a call, I'll come look at it. And I've went and looked at a few fields and it has not been related to wheat stem soft fly. So while we're capturing adults, we don't seem to be having the same uh, the same cutting of stems, knock on wood, that we're not seeing that. Um, but that continues to be a discussion point, and I think we're trying to be very comprehensive and looking for wheat stem sawfly. We are doing some research, or we have been for the past several years, looking at solid stemmed wheat varieties and how they fit in Northwest Kansas. Lucas Haig and I have been working on some of that. And um, in many cases, when we get some moisture, that has been yielding, I think within around 80, 85% of what some of the hollow stems are doing, um, necessarily and maybe drought stress conditions, but so far so good. And I know that there's active breeding programs with other, um, with CSU and other companies. So um, hopefully we will not need that technology and those soft flies will just stay over in Colorado. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do your best job to keep them over there, but I uh, appreciate the update, Jeannie. Uh, if you have any more questions for Jeannie, just submit those on chat or uh, to her individually. She's always, always good about responding for it, so. Okay, well, um, cross your fingers, everybody. We're gonna go try to go live out to the field with our friend uh, Romlo Lolato, who's uh, with K-State Extension. Hey, there he is. Um, let me see if I can. Uh... You guys might be able to hear the wind already. Okay, we can we can see you and hear you. All right, okay, so excellent. Tell us where you are. Well, very well. Uh... Good afternoon, folks. I'm here in actually in Ness County, which is a little bit out of the route where uh, the, the tour went today. But that's actually because uh, I started the tour yesterday, did some routes in north central Kansas, and uh, continued that today. And, and, and I'm starting tomorrow's uh, tour kind of today, right? So uh, I guess, Jeannie, first, thank you for the, for the excellent presentation there about the conditions of the wheat in northwest Kansas. With that, uh, we'll probably focus more on what I've seen in North Central Kansas, both uh, yesterday and today as well. Uh, so uh, the, the region that we looked at was uh, starting there in Clay County, which is about in the eastern portion of North Central Kansas, going as far west as about Phillips County or so, uh, then down south to Rooks County and back east to, to about Cloud County. So, so that entire region that we call uh, North Central Kansas, 
And then uh, we started again back in Russell County, which is more in the south part of that South Central, and moved west to Ellis County, actually all the way to about Thomas County or so. Um, in that region, we did actually, uh, we, we, uh, we have done 26 yield estimates, 20 of those was in the north central region of the state. Um, our yield estimates range there anywhere from uh, 17 bushels per acre in the low side uh, to about 72 bushels per acre in the, in the high side, and it averaged 42. So uh, I, I don't have on top of my head how that compares to last year, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be uh, considerably below where we were uh, last year. If we would describe that region, right, the eastern portion of it, uh, Cloud County, uh, Clay County, they are in, in decent shape, right? They have enough moisture. The, the yield that we were measuring there, they were consistently on that 50-55 bushel per acre. Uh, as we headed west, probably up to about Republic County or so, we were still able to find some pretty decent yield potential. And as we were getting more into Smith County, uh, Phillips County, uh, that's where we were finding more on those uh, low 20s, 25 bushel per acre potential range. As Jeannie mentioned there for the Northwest, there's also a huge difference between crops that were planted late after a soybean, uh, that in fact, they had very little development and they felt that freeze uh, uh, much worse than some of the, the bigger crops. And so that's where we were measuring those uh, 17, 20 bushel per acre. So in that uh, late planted uh, fields after soybeans in the, in the very northern tier of, of counties in north central Kansas. As we went south a little bit from there, so Russell County, uh, Rooks County even, we started seeing some, some pretty good yield potential, kind of increasing yield potential towards that region. That's where more we measure those uh, 72 bushels per acre, uh, mostly between 60, 70. Uh, bushels per acre in that region. So uh, Rooks County go, going into uh, east into Russell County and then west again back into El Ellis County there. Now getting to Ellis County and west, we start get well, there was quite a bit of drought stress as well, especially in those fields in, in Phillips uh, County. And then in western uh, Ellis County and west from there, we we're also finding several fields that were uh, quite drought stressed. Development-wise, we were ranging from uh, anywhere from the, the boot stage in that uh, northern part of, of the state to, uh, to, to flowering. In fact, this, uh, this field that I am at here in, uh, in Lane County is actually flowering. We can kind of see, I don't know if we'll be able to see, but we can kind of see the anthers in, in some of these right there, some of the heads. kind of tells us that uh, the development of these crop is at flowering. So, Overall, the main things that we saw in North Central Kansas, again, that drought and freeze, they were very consistent. Every single field, I was even getting tired of tweeting that because uh, every single field was like, okay, well, we're seeing this drought and freeze symptoms here. What does that look like? Sometimes uh, the, the lower canopy is going to be very lush. You can see that there is a lot of density of stems in the lower canopy, but really the upper canopy is much thinner. You don't have the same number of stems that are actually going to produce a head on those upper can on the upper canopy mostly because they uh, they were terminated by the freeze back in April. So they are still there. They're making volume, right? But you can tell that they are they're gone and they're not going to produce. So uh, that's the most uh, consistent thing that we saw field after field in that north central part of the state, freeze damage. And again, kind of like, like what Jeannie mentioned, depending on uh, planting date and crop season there. Very consistent in that part of the state, we also saw a ten spot. So uh, every uh, dense spot in Septoria, so that complex of, of leaf spotting diseases, it was actually very consistent in many of the fields in that region. As far as stripe rust goes, which is a big concern, we found stripe rust in four counties. So uh, out of those counties in North Central Kansas, in four of them, we found either in the, we didn't find any in the flag leaf, we found more in the, in the middle of the canopy, uh, but it's there, right? It, it's there um, and, and um, it can be a threat here coming up, especially because the crop there is still, as I mentioned, at that boot stage starting to head. Um, as far as viral diseases, uh, barley yellow dwarf was the one that was more consistent as well. Um, so this year, after that freeze, probably about 10 days after the freeze, when I was going around the state and, and uh, trying to find freeze damage, I was very, very consistently finding aphids. So aphids infest aphid infestation, so uh, mostly bird cherry oak aphid, but some green bugs as well. So it was very consistent. Um, and now that's kind of translating into some, some barley yellow dwarf. But uh, it's not something that is uh, too widespread, but every now and then we'll come across fields that, uh, that have hot spots 
of, um, of barley level corn. So Errol, that's an update there from the, the north central uh, part of the state. Um, any questions about that, that portion of the state? Uh, it doesn't look like we have any on chat. I, I think you gave a good overview of what you saw and again a lot of variability up there. Um, I know you're in, in west central Kansas now but if you can maybe I don't know, can you take your phone down into the canopy and, and show folks a little bit closer up what that looks like right now? Sure, definitely. So talking about the variability effect, uh, whenever I uh, saw to for this phone call here because the uh, internet is what I was looking for and here it seems like we had a good spot, I actually stopped that a field across the road and it was pretty terrible. So I said, okay, well, let me, let me move across the road and this actually looks pretty good. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's what we're talking about, the variability there, right? So let me switch my camera here, and so this is a crop that has been planted at a row spacing of 12 inches, as you can see here. Uh, it's a pretty wide row spacing, and it's interesting because when we're doing our, our yield calculations in a row spacing of 12 inches like this, very often the number of heads that we have in a foot translate in very, very close to the number of bushels per acre that, that uh, the crop harvest, at least using the formula from the USDA. Year one is permanently closing its retail stores due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, we're getting some outside audio. Can everybody uh, mute their phones or microphones, please? And uh, so, so again, uh, a crop here that is at that, uh, I don't know if you can see, but at that and this is phase, right? We have some anthers coming out there. Overall, pretty good yield potential, very decent height. We're probably talking about uh, two, two and a half foot tall here. Uh, some of the lower canopy, let me try to show here. So the lower canopy uh, is kind of drying out, as you can see there. But again, this is nothing compared to, to what I've seen in, in some of the other fields. So this field, it looks like it has lost some pillars, perhaps because of that. Uh, that freeze that we talk about lost some leaves as well, but it likely had a considerable amount, amount of moisture to recover here. The conditions become worse as we move west as far as recovery goes. Um, so I guess I stopped in a field that doesn't really have um, a whole lot of issues <laughs> that, that we have been talking about. But again, uh, west central Kansas is coming this side, uh, very variable as well. We were uh, before here, uh, drove through. Um, Lane County and Scott County and, and Wichita County and although we see uh, very good yield potential fields those are usually irrigated and you see the, the corners of the irrigation pivots uh, they, they're actually going through drought stress so the irrigated fields out in this region are looking pretty good it seems like uh, from, from here where we are uh, in, in I think I guess there was a question where I am now so uh, I'm just east of Dayton, actually, Ness County, the county where I'm at, just east of Dayton here. And again, here we're in a field that is in actually pretty good shape. Uh, I haven't done the youth estimate on this one yet. I just drove in as we were doing the call, but um, it's a pretty good shape one. But it's a very variable field. We do the youth estimate here and across the road, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, we're going to have probably a 20 and a 60 bushel per acre field. Of course, these are talking about potential of the field. We need rain to get there, but um, very variable. Uh, Romlo, we do have one question. So uh, referring again to north central Kansas today or what you've seen today, what do you think was worse, uh, drought damage or freeze damage? That's a tough one because honestly, I think it's a combination of both. Uh, the drought is really taking its toll. I mean, I, I showed that map yesterday for those who were on the call of how far behind North Central Kansas is in total precipitation from the beginning of the season until today. Um, I, I believe we're up to about five inches or so behind where we should be in a normal year. So drought is definitely taking its toll. But the, probably the worst problem there was that we had those extremely cold temperatures that, uh, as Jeannie showed just a minute ago here, uh, took many of the dealers out, right? It, it really uh, killed many of the dealers. And if we have moisture, the plant at that stage can still recover quite well. But then we were in, in these very dry conditions that the, the, the plant just couldn't recover. So it's really a combination. Uh, I think it's hard to say. I, I, I would think that probably drought is, is a bigger concern. I would um, think of other regions that got the freeze as well, but, uh, but got some moisture, they recover well. 
So I think it's a combination, but if I would choose one over the other, I think drought is taking a bigger toll to the crop than, than what the freeze did. Do we have any other questions, Errol? Aaron, you're muted. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, <laughs> Romulo, it doesn't look like we have any more questions right now. So uh, stay safe and travel safe out there and, and we'll let you go and hopefully talk to you again tomorrow. Excellent, sounds good, Errol. Uh, just before I go, a uh, quick shout out there to my partner here, Giovanna. She's been the one helping me out getting a lot of these things done. And COVID times, you know, we, we need to stick to those that uh, are already closed. And so really well, appreciate your help. I'm glad, you ha I'm glad you have the company out there. Thanks, Romo. Thank you. Okay, well, let's just look at a, a couple more things real quickly, and then we will uh, get to the numbers uh, for today. Um, we did have a, um, a few more slides uh, that were submitted with some of the photos um, and the results that we got posted in. On the left there today, you see Smith County uh, at around 45 bushels per acre. There's a photo on the right from Osborne County, 28 bushels per acre. You can definitely see the thin stand and the drought effects there. Uh, the next slide, Jewel County in, in that drought area again, compounded the freeze damage. Uh, yield estimate there at 43 bushels per acre. Uh, visual would say that's probably on the high side. Uh, but on the right-hand side, you have uh, a field that looks pretty good in Osborne County, but the uh, person who estimated this field said some of the, uh, the heads were trapped, which means uh, due to freeze damage, that whorl or that top leaf will actually constrict and prevent that head from emerging all the way up the stem. So uh, that can be an issue with some of those freeze damage areas. Uh, there's a photo in Graham County. Uh, again, very poor stand affected by drought, obviously. Uh, but on the on the right hand side, Thomas County, Northwest Kansas, uh, 47 bushels per acre. Uh, they need some moisture out there and have a potential for a really good crop if they can get some rain here in the next seven days. Uh, there is spring wheat in Kansas, in Northwest Kansas. That photo on the left was sent to us. Um, so I don't know how spring wheat is supposed to look at this time of year, but it, it, it looks fairly good to me. Um, uh, we estimate we have about 10,000 uh, acres, 10 to 15,000 acres of, of spring wheat in Kansas this year. Uh, and on the right hand side, there's more freeze damage in Northwest Kansas. You can see what Jeannie was talking about, those early tillers, those dead leaves at the bottom, they were all killed by that freeze. And then these secondary tillers had to come out of that plant. And I saw some of those fields uh, three or four weeks ago, and it's frankly amazing how, how well they've recovered from uh, where they were in freeze damage. Okay, so uh, here are the uh, numbers for today. Our yield range in north central Kansas was 25 uh, to 59 bushels per acre. Uh, with the reports we got in, that gives you a yield average in north central Kansas of 41.1 bushels per acre. The yield range in northwest Kansas was uh, extreme, and a low of 20 and a high of 117 and that gave us a yield average in Northwest Kansas of 51.7 bushels per acre. So again, just wanna remind everybody, this is, this is by no means scientific. We're not taking as many measurements as they would have on the wheat tour. Uh, and there is that USDA number already out there. Uh, the USDA average for the state was 47 bushels per acre. So we'll see how things work out the next two days. You know, all these regional averages, if they balance out to uh, be close to that USDA number, but we're, almost certainly to see uh, lower numbers in West Central and Southwest Kansas uh, when we give the report tomorrow. Um, there's the formula again, you've all seen that. So we'll just, um, I'll just leave this data on the screen there and um, we'll see if we have any questions. Uh, I'm gonna have to stop share to see the chat, I guess. Okay, so a uh, question is, can you remind us of who's pulling samples and how many people are sampling? Uh, we don't have a solid count on how many people are out there sampling. We just get a number of the reports that are in, but we're using certified crop advisors. Those are crop consultants across the state who have that 
CCA certification. A huge help from K-State um, Extension, the, the extension county extension agents out there, regional extension agents, um, agronomists uh, such as Jeannie and Romlo, uh, some of our staff members, uh, our CEO, Justin Gilpin, uh, is out there on the road as well as, as Taylor on our staff. And then we've got quite a few of our, our board member farmers that are out there taking the samples. Uh, I don't have a specific number on how many samples. It's in, it's in the dozens. Uh, I know we had uh, over 50 samples. So again, the, the Wheat Quality Council, you know, would get 250 to 300 plus samples a day. And we just don't, uh, don't have that much manpower out there. Uh, we won't have any comments on harvest estimate per region, you know, crop abandonment. Um, we might try to come up with a number, but that's very region specific. Crop abandonment obviously is going to be higher in southwest and west central Kansas and probably much, much lower in the central and northwest part of the state. But when we uh, provide a total crop number for Thursday, we'll, we'll try to provide some input on what we think is is going to happen with crop abandonment and uh, there are some fields being destroyed obviously in southwest Kansas already so tomorrow hopefully we'll get some uh, more reports on those. And Marsha just mentioned the Nebraska and Colorado slides are already posted on the website and we'll have a recording of this video on the website and also um, the slide presentations on the website also. So. Uh, we'll meet back here again tomorrow at 4 p.m. At that point in time, we'll look at the numbers from West Central and Southwest Crop Districts and have some more reports out in the field. So thanks, everybody, again, for attending, for participating. Um, glad you could all join us this afternoon. And hopefully we can see you all again tomorrow, same place, same time at 4 o'clock. Have a good evening.